Before so I am glad that you are back again as we um, spend some more time in the book of James. We are going to be starting with James chapter four, and we're going to start right at verse one, and we'll see how far we go. We may finish, we may not, and that's okay. Um, but let us have a moment of prayer. Dear gracious Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together to contemplate your word and to see what you have for us. I ask that you may fill us with a new desire to be your friend today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's, that's going to pop up in our study, so that's why I use that phrase today. So let us start James chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Who would like to read those for us? I could. Thanks, Karen. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? All right. Um, lots of stuff in there, right? Um, does any of that sound familiar? Have you heard any of these phrases before? Resist the devil and, devil and he will flee. Yes. Oh. A, bunch, a bunch of them, actually. Yes, yes. I think this is one that's right. a very familiar passage for a lot of us. Keep going, Marcia. The song, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Mm -hmm. You know, and also um, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's tons of them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How about you don't ask because you don't you don't get because you don't ask? Sometimes we don't want it. So Charlene, you're very muffled. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll move around. Either. There you go. Can you say that again then? Uh, you don't you don't ask so you don't get. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's okay to ask. Please ask. Mm -hmm. so but i what i find very interesting is number one verse one the first thing what causes i in the nfa it says fights and quarrels amongst you do we have fights and quarrels <laughs> that no we're too civilized <laughs> what, what about in the world in general what causes wars what causes fights what causes quarrels what causes arguments we want what someone else has i mean one country wants the land or the resources of another mm -hmm. 
I'm going to say pride. Pride. <laughs> and Karen? Greed. And um, what's another um, word that I think goes along with what people want to have? Selfish. Power. Power. And Power. what was yours, Peter? Selfishness. Selfish. Selfishness. Yeah. Selfishness. Mm -hmm. The idea that I deserve what you have. Right. Right. Um, right. We see some of this too, just in politics. This country has this and we want it, so we should have it. Um, we see it with how the vaccine is being rolled out to different countries and who gets um, their country still waiting for the very first dose of the vaccine, right? Um, because they don't have the right connections because other countries will hoard it for themselves. Um, yeah, our whole continents. I mean, Africa is basically unvaccinated. Right, so there's, right? there's, there's a huge disparity, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. and throughout history, that's, isn't that what Rome did? They wanted to conquer and rule the world and have the empire and the, the British did it, the British empire. They figured we know how to rule you better than you know how to rule yourself and ended up actually wiping out a lot of the good and the advances that the countries had to begin with. Um, so well, we it, basically did that to Native Americans in America. Exactly, exactly. Um, I think of, um, I think of the Puritans who came to America who were fleeing per religious persecution, but they went ahead and persecuted anyone who didn't believe like them. Right, um, and so it's very easy once you um, are no longer oppressed if you're not careful to then become an oppressor because you get that taste of power. You get it, so that's that greed, it's that desire that's building up, well, I deserve this, or well, God's given me wisdom, so my way is the only way. Um, and that only works with me personally, right? My way is the only way. Um, so yeah, so we desire what we don't have um, and what we don't need, especially in our society. I know, I'm looking around one of my cluttered rooms and I can tell you, I do not need 90% of what's in this room. Or if you have a, like a working iPhone mm -hmm. or, and then the latest and greatest comes out and you think that you need that, you, right. you don't, you have a phone that works just as well. You know, it's not broken, screen isn't smashed, so. Similar. Right. Um, we think that we deserve the conveniences that the next person has. And, um, and we often judge people because they're not doing things or we think that they deserve to be lesser. You'll hear complaints about what people spend their SNAP resources on, you know? And it's like, okay, shouldn't you just be glad that we're there to help people who need it? Now you were gonna start saying, nope, you deserve the, the lowest of the low because you can't afford whatever. So I'm putting the worth on your life and what you're allowed to want and what you're allowed to have. I'm just thinking about those people that have the tiny homes mm -hmm. and how I always look around and I think, wow, I, yeah, I really don't need all this stuff that I have in my house. If I could live in that much space and just have everything that I absolutely need, I'd, I give a lot of credit to those people. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, it's interesting how we judge too, because we're going to, in general, we judge someone if they live in a single wide trailer in a trailer park, but we're not gonna judge somebody who's squatting on their best friend's yard in a tiny home with a combustible toilet, right? Yeah. Because, oh, they're, they're, they're elite, whatever. Um, but so there's different levels we have of what we judge people by. My, uh, my... I, I heard a really interesting discussion Yes. About um, poverty and wealth and how um, rather than feel guilty or feel like we're taking more than our share, um, humans tend to make up stories about why they deserve what they have and the other people don't. And so not only do we we add to the burden of poverty on these people by making up stories that tell us that they deserve to less. You know when it's when it's not necessarily true at all. Yes, and and, and so yeah. I I've been really impressed since then to not 
you know, we need to not do that to people, not to make up stories about why they deserve. In fact, you know, colonialism, whether it was the Americans with the Indians or, or the English with India or many countries in Africa, when, well, these people are just primitive and stupid and they need someone to, you know, show them the way they ought to really live and they don't have any idea how to spend their wealth or live their life. And so we need to go in and show them and, and excuse colonialism mm -hmm. by making up those stories about the primitive and, and stupid and, you know, and, and uh, whatever of, of the people that are being conquered. Yes. And, and we just need to be so careful not to lay that burden on people and take over their lives because they don't know how to live them. I mean, that's basically what what colonialism yeah. did. Yeah, the white man's burden. So um, we need to educate you. And, and we're going to come back to this idea too when we get to chapter five um, and the mindset of oppressors. Um, the idea of, oh, well, they're lazy, so they don't deserve whatever. And we see that now with the unemployment rates and like, well, oh, people just want to collect mm -hmm. unemployment versus, oh, maybe, you know, 600 million people you know, people died, and so there's job vacancies, or you were underpaid. Um, I, there was, uh, so I just read a story this week, uh, Jeff Bezos flew out to space, yeah. and, you know, he, he amassed his millions by underpaying his workers at Amazon, by union busting, um, all of this stuff, and, you know, price gouging, not price gouging, but um, undercutting local businesses and that kind of stuff. And so when he got back from space, he's like, this is um, my Amazon customers and workers paid for this. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. You're, you're, you're praising people because you oppress them. <laughs> and so they made you get yeah. more space. All right. How many want to admit they use Amazon? <laughs> oh, I do all the time. I admit it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. It's it's, you know, but they they've got a good green record. They're trying to. I mean, you know, that it's it's it kind of evolving. Um, and they 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 I do they do they ruin more businesses than they create? I don't know. I mean, it's a. It's still an ongoing story, but you know, I I like to buy local. I I kind of like that, that. You know, I think your local person, but it is kind of nice. I mean, I I've ordered stuff on a like a Monday morning, and I see a truck Monday afternoon. I go, well, it can't be it, and yet there it is. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of uh, and you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I think one of the terrible tragedies is that, you know, the billions and billions that Jeff Bezos is holding on to or spent squandering, flying up into space, there's so much suffering on the earth that he could be alleviating. And he would feel so much better about himself if he did that, instead of spending it all on himself or hoarding it, you know, and I, I think you have to feel sorry for the, the extremely wealthy you know, I mean, I heard him interviewed too, and he went, oh, everybody should do this, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, and as far as him being green, I'd be more impressed if he was actually using his own money to create that green instead of what he's taken from his employees and from the little businesses that he squeezes to death, you know, so, so, you know, it's great that he's been able to create this empire and amass all this wealth, but but, you know, we have this big medical um, conglomerate here in North Dakota and, and the most wealthy man in North Dakota owns it and he squeezes his doctors and nurses so hard that he can't get anybody to work for him and, and delivers an inferior product and abuses his employees and I'm like, I'm not impressed that he's the richest man in North Dakota because he's he's made that money by um, by squeezing it out of other people. So, you know, and I, I suppose you can, I, I don't mean to 
uh, be condemning. I think I think I'm I'm seeing that we need to feel sorry for those people yeah, that and- they don't understand that that giving to others would make their life so much richer. And yeah. they might, I mean, you know, his trip up into space might cost him his trip to heaven because he's being so selfish and and not giving back so it's it's a great tragedy i think Mm -hmm. that the very wealthy don't understand the blessings they could get from from giving instead of squandering yes so anyway i'm sorry i didn't mean to pre no you're 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 good and and again we're going to get into that a little bit more in chapter five because uh, it deals more more that in but again it's always what you want when you have it seems to be when you have a lot you can never have enough right you're always wanting more um, so let's go to this yeah, that's that's a, that's a sickness you know i've i've been i was in over years anonymous for a number of years and we talk about that there that mm-hmm. you never it's like there's never enough you can't be can't get enough food you can't be thin enough you can't be rich enough you can't be smart enough you can't be you know and and we're never satisfied and we try to fill that hole up with food so and and other people fill it up with other things and if we can have that i mean it talks about that here when we have that connection to jesus Mm -hmm. we're not so hungry anymore you know we're Mm -hmm. we're satisfied and we don't have to fill up that hole by taking stuff from other people. And and the problem is a lot of times human beings don't feel like they have enough if somebody else, I mean, they have to have more than everybody else and then they still don't have enough. Right. You know, uh, it's it's a really tragic state of mind. Yeah, we have a skewed that, that, idea of what's good for us and it started in the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the whole, you know, the proud boy shouting, you know, marching, yelling, Jews will not replace us. You know, that's that's a poverty state of mind where there's never enough to go around and you have to grab what's yours. And it doesn't matter if you take it away from someone else because you deserve it, you know, and we're not going to let anyone else replace us. And and in God's economy, no one is replaced by anyone else. Right. We're not commodities. That, no, we don't have to take away from other people to feel like we have enough or we're good enough or, you know, squeeze people out so we can have the spot, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Re- and that's one of the things I love about James is that it really addresses that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Peter, were you going to add something? No, I was just going to say at the cross, we're all, we're all on the same level, rich mm-hmm. poor, between billionaire, yeah. billionaire, it doesn't matter. The cross is a great leveler because we all, we all need Jesus, you know, and some, we just, we just want to be there and recognize our great, like you say, our great poverty. You know? mm-hmm. So what yeah, is because it? we are all, you know, the, the riches of heaven make the richest person on the earth look like they have nothing. You know, the joke about the, the guy who comes up to the, to the gates of the Holy city and, he has bags of gold and he says, can I bring this in? And the angel goes, well, I suppose if you want to, but we paid streets with that here. <laughs> you know, so it's like showing up with a bag of asphalt, you know, and, and we just need to keep that perspective that the wealth of the world is, Paul called it garbage compared to the riches of heaven. And it's not worth losing heaven over mm-hmm. at all. Yeah, so so you let's know. let's focus a second on this idea. So being called a dust, uh, it starts in verse four. Being called adulterous people, um, this is not this is not talking about you know people sleeping around. This is about worship, um, you know, over and over again. Um, the God's chosen people are called adulterous when they strayed away from God, right? Um, so that's what it's about. It's not about sex or anything like that here. It's about worship and here, friendship with the world. What do you think about this phrase that friendship with the world means enmity against God? That's kind of harsh. 
Well, didn't Jesus say, if you put your hand to the plow and look back, then you're not worthy to, you're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. And I think he went on and said many other things about, uh, about you know, I, I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword to, to bring division. Not that he's against uh, family traditions and family harmony, but it, when you choose Jesus, you're going to have, you're going to have, uh, I, I think as a Christian, if you choose Jesus, you seem like you're always swimming upstream against the tide, so to speak. So, um, you know, I think that's some what it's talking about. Well, and if we relate it to the first part with, you know, wars and strifes and quarrels, isn't the way of the world these days violence? And even back then. So how do you solve a solution? With a sword, with a gun, with a boot to the face, right? Um, is that what God wants for us? To solve our to solve our disputes with bombs and missiles? No. Um, and that's what being having friendship with the world is, right? You become like who you spend time with. Um, I think I've said that I got suspended in academy because um, my roommate was smoking and I didn't say anything about it. So it was guilt by association and they actually separated us and we couldn't room together because they said that we fed off each other, which eh. Um, <laughs> but it, it yeah. matters who you're spending time with. And you always think that you're going to be the good influence on people, but, and sometimes we are, but that's not always the case. Right. Yeah. When I was in college, I had a friend who um, was swearing all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and one day something happened and the word just popped out of my mouth. And I almost like looked over my shoulder and went, oh, who said that? You know, because I never used that word in my entire life. Mm -hmm. you know, in the context of swearing and, and it is, you are influenced by who you hang out with. You just are, you know, mm -hmm. I went, wow, I think I not, I need to not hang out with that person. If they have that much influence over me, that, that, you know, a swear word just slips out of my mouth at an inopportune moment because I've been hearing it so much. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. so I, I think who you hang out with really yeah, and going back you know, to, yeah, it, it does make a difference. And going back to what Peter was saying about having to swim upstream. So, you know, my, one of my favorite commentators, um, N.T. Wright, and his, he's talking about this idea of friendship of the world. And in, again, it's power that counts with people and what sway you have over. So he says, you know, people can smile and appear friendly and civilized. Society may appear open and generous. But if you go against them, if you challenge cherished assumptions, there are ways of making you feel their displeasure. You see that now, if you call out um, the fact that there has historically been systems of oppression, or if you call out Christian nationalism, they think that you're attacking Jesus. Or if you, uh, you know, call out um, civil rights infractions, then, oh my goodness, you're against, um, against our country or your treason is for acknowledging the fact that we do not have a um, equal society, right? And people get punished in one way or the other. Um, I think we've seen, you know, some, some Republicans who stood up for the election results being what they were, were punished by their own team because they didn't play the game the way they were supposed to play the game. And so, if we don't play the game the way that the world wants us to play the game, then we have to, we'll usually get their retribution. Think of um, to what extent people go for payback, the fact that we need a witness protection agency, right? Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise mm -hmm. doing the right thing could get you killed or your loved ones. That's the friendship of the world they're talking about. It's not saying, hey, you know what? I'm gonna love this person. I'm gonna love my neighbor because we, that's what we're called to do. So that's not this friendship. This isn't caring for the sick and the needy and the poor regardless of their faith. That's not what that means. 
it means like building in a friendship with the power structures. When my daughter was younger, I used to tell her, a real friend wants you to be the best person you can be. And if you have someone who's encouraging you to not be the bet your best, then that person is really not your friend because they really don't want your best. They don't have your best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. And, and that's basically, you know, being friends with the world, they, they will use you, but they don't really care about what happens to you. Mm -hmm. In fact, like you said, they'll, if you go against them, they might actually punish you for that in one way or another. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing that I think is even more important is we're one person and we have 24 hours in a day. And so when we choose to be with one person, it sort of means that we choose not to be with someone else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where it says the Holy Spirit yearns to be our friend, basically. You know, God wants us to be his friend. And if we let too much other stuff get in the way, by virtue of exclusion, we don't have the time or the energy or whatever to spend time mm -hmm. with, you know, and, and if the world is at enmity with God, then, you know, I always think, well, can't we just all get, be, get along and be together, you know, and all my friends in one place, that's my idea of happiness, you know, but, but there are some friends that just don't want to be with each other. Mm -hmm. And you have to choose. And that's basically what James is saying here. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so this idea of being a friend of God instead of the friend of the world, how do you get to be and maintain a friendship with God? And this is that kind of next, I think seven through 10 deals a lot with that, um, humbling ourselves. Uh, you know, I, something that I'm very guilty of is I might spend five minutes in devotion in the morning and then spend another two hours watching TV, right? Who am I spending my time on? Who am I forging my friendship with? These characters that don't exist um, or with God in the morning, right? Um, right. You have to spend time with people if you're going to be friends. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, like maintaining a marriage, you have to spend time with your spouse or you'll grow apart. That's just, you know, that time and attention to the relationship is crucial, whether it's with God or with other people. Yeah. And it's that idea, again, you're going to grow closer to whoever you're spending the most time with. There's jokes that the people have like an office spouse, right? Because they might spend more time at the office um, hanging out with those people than they do with their own spouse at home. Right. And they become yeah. good friends. That's it. So coming near to God so that God will come near to you. Um, wash your hands. This is not just like a COVID thing infection control thing. Um, that's one of my mom's favorite verses, wash your hands. And I think it's in Isaiah as well. Um, but, you know, so that washing hands was part of ritual purity. And, um, you know, James is not saying we need to be ritualistic about it, but that took intentionality. So think of it that way, intentionality versus ritual. Um, purify your hearts. Um, you double-minded, we are all double-minded because we, we fight that selfishness inside of us. Um, grieve and mourn and wail. How often do you hear that Christians are supposed to grieve and mourn and wail? Th this seems like the exact opposite of what was James 1, live in all joy. So isn't that how part, do you- Isn't yeah. that part of the Sermon on the Mount? You know, blessed are those who mourn. I don't think it was mm -hmm. talking losing a loved one or a family member I think it's a mourning for our condition mm -hmm. and knowing that there is a solution you know found mm -hmm. in Jesus and uh, you know I think that's uh, that's the lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom 
doesn't want us to be gloomy or depressed, but it's all about being, you know, relationship with God and humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. So it's recognizing our wretched condition. We're blind, naked, think we're rich and we're poor. And, you know, just like it talks about the Laodicean church. Yeah. And so recognizing our condition. Yeah. And how often do we sit down and have a time of self-reflection, self-examination? Um, I think we probably don't want to do it that much. It was part of the Jewish culture. When you went out and you took your journey to Jerusalem, you know, you're thinking about why you're going, what the purpose was. Um, when you're, you know, getting your sacrifice, uh, you think of uh, Muslims when they're going um, to Mecca and making this pilgrimage and journey. Pilgrimages were huge, and that gives you time to think and dwell. Um, in, you know, church history for Christianity, the idea of um, spiritual retreats and spending time um, maybe in the desert, not the, your whole life, you don't have to be an aesthetic, but, um, you know, uh, it's, what's one of the words for it? Um, spiritual direction, just spending quiet time with God, spiritual retreats. Now, now, now you can go, you can go too far with that. We see mm -hmm. the monastic kind of a lifestyle, you know, where you live in a cloister with, and you don't speak and you, you, you just, you just, as George Knight would say, you're trying to be good by not being bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Thing, you know? And that's, that's always a very tiresome, weary, dreary kind of existence. <laughs> right. And so that goes back to, you know, when talking about, talking about your motivation, right? And I think there's, there's place for that maybe in short term, but when you take years and years, it might be a little bit more of an issue. And we can also mess this up because they usually have, um, so our conference does elders retreats, right? And they do pastors retreats. And too often in my mind, they're presentation after presentation after presentation, and there's no actual retreat time, one-on-one -on -one time or small group time to just sit and listen to God and figure and have expectant prayer. It's all about educating us and not self-reflecting. I must, I must well, say, I know. I like the Trappist jelly though from Spencer Mass. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, in the temple service, yes, Marcia. Oh, in the temple service, between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, there are ten days, and the and the Feast of Trumpets, they blew the trumpets to call people to a time of reflection, and you were the in you were supposed to spend those ten days reflecting upon your life and seeing you know what needed to be made amends for or what needed to be changed and and we as christians are very reluctant to look at ourselves you know but in 12-step recovery you have to do that searching and fearless moral inventory and admit to god and to yourself and and you talk to one other person it's not about confession like confessing to a priest it's talking to someone who's gone through this and knows what you should look for, you know, and then, you know, and, and like one of the ways that you do that reflection is you look at your fears and your resentments and see what that tells you about your life, you know, or there are different ways to do it. But, and then you're supposed to daily ask those questions again, you know, like what has there been anything in my life today that, was based on fear or resentment or self-seeking or self, what's the other ones? Uh, uh, you know, looking down on yourself, I can't think of the word right now, but, but you know, so we, if we examine our life like that every day, those things won't creep back in. And as an alcoholic, it's very important to do those things because if you, uh, if if you don't, your old lifestyle will creep back in and you'll start feeling guilty and bad about yourself again. And then you're tempted to go back to using a substance to avoid your life because it's miserable and you feel terrible about yourself. So, so it's really, really important. And I think Christians would be so much more powerful 
if they were willing to do that, you know, and God built it right into the temple service. You get 10 days every year when you do that, you know. So anyway, so I think you're right about those retreats. It's not to sit and talk and have someone talk at you. It's to sit and examine your life and what is God pointing out to you that you, you know, a character defect that keeps coming back to bite you over and over and over. And, and why do those, why do I keep doing those self-defeating behaviors over and over? And, and, and I need to ask God to remove that. So I don't, so I can be a more effectual person for, you know, I mean, like the seventh step prayer asking to have character defects removed, you ask God to please remove from me every defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and to my fellows, you know, but we, we keep doing the same things over and over because we don't, we don't want to look at that, even that we are doing that. And then we don't want to look at why, what's the, what, why am I doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and, and so I, yeah, I'm doing a lot of preaching today, but anyway. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> Peter? No, I was just going to say our new, our, our new version of what you were talking about, blowing the ram's horn and calling to contemplation and self-examination. We have that with the communion service, you know, as we um, we're told to, if we need to make some amends, we need to, we should do them before we partake of that, uh, before the bread and the wine, so to speak. And um, so that's a, that's a kind of a time of reflection, you know, that Jesus instituted that at his last meal with his disciples yeah. and said, do this in remembrance of me. But we have plenty of instruction. I mean, I think it has to be a daily thing. I mean, I mean, we celebrate communion every quarter. So every what, 13 weeks or so. So that's, that's uh, a lot of, if we're going to examine ourselves on that 12th week leading up to uh, communion, <laughs> that's not enough time. I think it is, it is a daily, Paul says I die daily. I mean, it, it's a, it's a daily thing. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that we have that though. I, I'm glad that, uh, you know, that our church, we, we, we do, you know, that we do celebrate the Lord's Supper. Which interesting. Yeah, one one of the unfortunate things in this chaotic life is that we don't just march through the week the year like that. So, you know, it's not unusual to show up for church and discover that it's communion Sabbath and you had no idea that it was, so you have no time to prepare. You know, so so, so, so Hey, I guess we're prepared, right? <laughs> well, and also yeah. when you announce it, um, communion tends to be the less, um, the least attended uh, church service. And and some of that is people are uncomfortable with foot washing um, for whatever reason. It may have nothing to do with the ritual itself. They just don't like feet. Um, you know, what whatever it is, and it, it, or they don't see the same meaning because it's so far removed from our culture where it was a big part of their culture back then. Um, so some of that, um, or some people, they, they just yeah, well, don't people feel, don't wanna, they don't feel ready. They don't feel worthy. And so then right. they stay home because they don't want to, either they feel like they're going to be punished or they feel like someone's going to notice. And there's, you can get in your head about it. Um, and in well, a Bible way, says. It, it, it says to not do it um unworthily. unworthily but it also is every single time you eat and drink and fellowship together so even at potlucks there is a sense of communion that's supposed to be there um, and so you need to have that daily time of reflection so you are always ready to be in community with each other um i have a good I, friend who yes oh, i have a good friend who is a pastor in another church, in a non-denominational church, but but um, <laughs> uh, he would if he had a couple that came to him that were fighting, he would have them wash each other's feet. And his wife told me when his kids were growing up, if they got into a fight with each other, he would have them wash each other's feet. You know, so I mean, he just incorporated it into people's lives, and and it brought. I mean, that would be wonderful if we would do that. Just just think if we would humble ourselves to wash each other's feet when we feel angry with someone or 
whatever, how, how powerful that would be, yeah. if, you know, so. And so I also just wanted to bring out part of this self-reflection. And I say, you know, once all these things open up, I'd love to take a weekend and do a spiritual retreat weekend in one of these local monasteries or um, um, there's a convent uh, group um, out in central Massachusetts that was on beautiful grounds, you know, and just spend a weekend away um, without the distractions of my life that I can so readily distract myself with, right? Um, but it's time spent evaluating um, purifying our hearts and it's about who you are deep down which we don't like to see you know holding up that mirror who we are um who we want to be and why we want to be that you know who we are in our own minds who we think we are for god to god who god is to us and why one of our hardest things i think is the why we don't want to dig deep we're we don't necessarily understand the um, the trauma behind whatever addiction it is, you know, whether it's a sin addiction. And and um, also, Marsha, you were saying, you know, when people uh, end up relapsing, they don't just start off small. They just basically start off where they were before. So you can't just yeah. relapse a little bit. You relapse where you were or worse. And right. that... So it's, it's important to have people around who are supporting you in your journey um, and to be able to do the work. If you never deal with the stuff that got you um, to the point of your addiction, then you're never going to have any hope of, um, I don't know if freedom is the right word for medicine, but even acknowledging your addiction, right? Yeah, in, in recovery, we say if nothing changes, nothing changes. And right. if you want something different, you have to do something different and you need to look at what it is that is holding you back from growing mm -hmm. and yeah. be willing to let that God remove that. Yeah. So this yeah. is what I, I'm going to make a uh, executive decision and we're going to stop with four verse 10 and we will pick up verse 11 next week because it's almost eight o'clock. But does anyone have any last thoughts that they want on this idea? We'll get into the slanderous part next week. Um, I want us to be able to do it justice and looks like dogs are barking again. Um, but any other last thoughts about this, these first 10 verses? Is it easy work? No. Is it work that we can do on our own, in our own power, grit our teeth and make it happen? No, I don't think so. We don't know how wretched we are. If we, we if left to ourselves, we think we're perfectly fine. Well, it's, especially, you know, compared to Peter, I'm great, right? But, <laughs> but if it wasn't for, what I always say, if it wasn't for God, we'd still be hunkered down in the Garden of Eden, hiding, you know? God mm -hmm. came, didn't find God. They weren't going to go find God. God found them. He finds mm -hmm. us where we are, and he's the one that brings us any any understanding of who we truly are or repentance that's a gift from god faith is a gift from god everything's from god so mm -hmm. definitely so if you get I'm well, gonna you, yes marcia go ahead oh psalm 139 search me and try me O lord and see if there be any the exact translation is any way of pain in me and leave me in the way everlasting so you know, whether the pain is because of what someone's done to us or because of what we're doing to somebody else, you know, we need to ask God, we, we have to ask him into the process or we just won't be able to do it. Right. It won't come out right. And we it have to be the Holy Spirit. We have to be willing to go on that journey of process as well. Right. That the last part of right. that, um, lead me, help me, help me go on it. Um, Definitely. Um, I'm, so I'm going to give you some homework before we go into um, sign off and go into our prayer time. Um, if you can, um, I would encourage you to set up out some time this week, uh, maybe over the weekend, maybe 10 minutes before bed, first thing in the morning, if you're a morning person, I am not, so that would never work um, for me. Uh, and take some time for self-reflection um, with God and uh, listening. Uh, one of the things that we have a hard, I have a hard time doing. Um, speaking is a whole lot easier than listening and asking God to help you see 
who you are, why you're who you are, and who God is to you and who you are to God. So like dwelling on some of those ideas, um, I would like to encourage you to spend some time doing that this next week. I won't make you report back next week. Um, this is an ungraded assignment. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Everybody gets an A. That's right. So we will be back next week, starting James chapter four, um, verse 11, picking up there. And we're going to sign off as we go and have some prayer time. Thanks so much for being with us and come join us next Wednesday. If you haven't tried being part of this group live, we'd love to have you.